This FizCast will look at the AC voltages across various components in an RLC circuit. Pause the video and read the question carefully. Now that you've read the question, you should be able to understand the nature of the circuit and the, the question is actually asking us a couple of things, namely the peak current that will flow in this circuit and the maximum voltages that are across the components. So to begin by interpreting our situation, this is a problem that involves an AC circuit. We're told it's a AC voltage supply that's attached to this circuit. Um, and so we're going to need to be concerned with not just resistances, but also reactances. Uh, and that will give rise to us having to consider the overall impedance of the circuit particularly in terms of finding the peak current. In our development stage, it might be useful to have a diagram here. So here might be our AC voltage source going through in series a resistor, an inductor, and a capacitor. And we can put some values on here to make sure we've understood the question correctly. Uh, there's a 500 ohm resistor. There's a 0 0.85 Henry inductor and there's a 2.2 microfarad capacitor. We have a voltage source here that's got a peak voltage of 100 volts and it's operating at a frequency of 70 hertz. So there's our circuit. Now to understand the relationship between these quantities we need to use the AC version of Ohm's law which tells us uh, one way to write it is that the peak voltage will be the peak current multiplied by the impedance of the circuit, which looks a bit like V equals IR for our DC case, except we need to be dealing either with peak values or peak to peak values or sometimes even preferably RMS values for our voltages and currents because we know they're going to be varying values in time. Our impedance here is our AC version of resistance and it's the combination of the square of the resistance and the square of the reactances where we actually do the inductive reactant XL minus the capacitive reactants XC and we square that difference and then we take the square root of that and that's what we mean by our uh, impedance Z and that's the quantity that tells us the relationship between the voltage and the current in our AC circuit. These reactances remember for an inductor it's fairly simple that's omega the angular frequency times L. For our capacitor, the reactance there is 1 divided by omega times C. And remember that omega here, our angular frequency, is 2 pi times our frequency. So we have enough there to be starting our evaluation step. The first thing we might like to do here is to calculate those reactances because we're going to need them to find the impedance, which we will need to find the current. So our inductive reactance here, remember, is omega L, which is 2 pi F times L, and we have all of those values from our problem. That's 2 pi times the 70 hertz that our voltage source is running at, um, times the inductance, which is 0.85 henrys, which is our SI unit of inductance. And we do that calculation, and we get a value there of 374, and our reactance is going to be adding to a resistance has the same units as resistance. So that's ohms. A similar calculation now for our capacitive reactants. It's 1 divided by omega c, which should be easy to see is 1 over 2 pi times 70 times our capacitance here, which is 2.2 microfarads. So it's 10 to the minus 6. And we do that calculation and we find our capacitive reactance is 1.03 by 10 to the power of 3 ohms, 1.03 kilo ohms there. And we already know from our circuit that the resistance there is 500 ohms. So we have enough information to now determine the impedance of this particular RLC circuit. So our Z here is going to be the resistance squared plus the difference between these reactances here. And so that would be 374 minus 1.03 by 10 to the 3. We square that 
and we're going to take the square root of that sum and then when we combine those quantities in that way we wind up with a value here of our impedance of 825 ohms. So now we can use that value for our impedance to find our peak current in the circuit. It will be the peak voltage divided by the impedance. Our peak voltage, remember, was 100 volts. That's what the source supplied. Our impedance here is 825 ohms. And we do that calculation and we find we end up with a current flowing in our circuit, a peak current of 0.12 amps, 120 milliamps. Now, the second part of the problem, now that we've found the peak current, was to determine the maximum voltage across each of the components. And here again, we can simply use our AC version of Ohm's law. In fact, for the resistor, it looks just like the DC version of Ohm's law. The maximum voltage across our resistor will equal the peak current times the resistance. And that's just going to be our 0.12 amps multiplied by our 500 ohms for this resistor and we find we actually have 60 volts is the peak voltage that runs across our resistor here. Similarly, we can calculate the maximum voltage across our inductor will be our peak current multiplied by our inductive reactance, which will be again 0.12 for the current. Our inductive reactance, recall, was 374 ohms. And we do that calculation and we find we get 45 volts across our inductor, that's the maximum voltage. And the maximum voltage across our capacitor is the peak current times the capacitive reactance. So 0 0.12 amps multiplied by our 1.03 kilo ohms. And we find we have a voltage there, a maximum voltage of 124 volts. So they're the three quantities that the question asked for in terms of the maximum voltages. Let's take some time here to do an assessment of this because immediately something here seems a little bit strange if you're not thinking about the problem carefully and that is that the maximum voltage across the capacity here 124 volts is actually larger than the peak voltage of our voltage source. Remember our voltage source had a 100 volt peak voltage and that seems initially of course a little strange um, which also adds to the problem that might might be apparent, might, might seem to be a problem, in that if I add up the voltages across these components, this 60 plus 45 plus 124, I certainly don't seem to add up to the applied voltage of 100 volts. Again, this, this capacitor seems to have a, a maximum voltage that's much larger. So uh, we might want to think about how we can understand that in our assess step in case we've made a mistake along the way. Now the important point to remember here is that not all of these voltages occur at the same time. In our AC circuit, there's going to be some kind of relationship in time, some phase relationship between when maximum current occurs and when maximum voltages occur. Uh, remember, there's, there's a different relationship for capacitors than there, than there is for inductors. For the resistor, of course, current and voltage are in phase, so they occur at the same time. So although we expect the sum of these to behave as they should when you go around the circuit, they're not all going to be appearing with their maximum values at the same time. So we might like to look at these rather than just as numbers, we like to take into account the phase difference between them and a phase or diagram can be quite useful there. So let's imagine for the time being that our maximum, that our current phasor points along horizontally. Remember a phasor is going to rotate around in time at the angular frequency um, of the system. But imagine it just points along in that direction for the time being. And now let's think about what our voltages are going to be doing. We know that our resistive, um, the voltage across our resistor, points in the same direction as the current. They're in phase. Now, what about the inductor? In an inductor, the voltage actually leads the current by 90 degrees. So if the current was sitting like that in our phasor diagram, then our voltage across the inductor will actually sit at 90 degrees to that, ahead of it. Remember, our phases rotate in an anti-clockwise direction here. And for a capacitor, it's kind of the opposite of an of a inductor. That is, the current will lead the voltage. And so we'd expect our capacitor to have a voltage across it, again, at right angles to the current, but behind the current in terms of the rotation of our phasors. I've not drawn this diagram particularly well here in terms of the relative size here. We can see that this 
voltage across our capacitor here is 124 volts. The voltage across our inductor here is only 45 volts. So if I consider those and add these voltages up as phasors now, rather than just as numbers, taking into account the phase relationship between these, uh, hopefully you can see that what I will get is I'll get a vector like this down the bottom here, which is going to be equal to, uh, at least in magnitude, um, 124 minus 45. And I'll have a vector across here, which is my resistive component, which will be 60. And the sum of those voltages should, of course, be equal to the applied voltage, but the sum taking into account the phase. So this here gives me uh, 79. So if I now look at the square root of 79 squared plus 60 squared, because this is a right angle triangle I've formed here from my phasors, I find that comes out to be, with some rounding errors, 99 volts. And remember, it was a 100 volt supply. So I've made a bit of an error here, maybe by rounding my figures too early, but that, that gives me some confidence that in fact, I do have the right numbers here. Although they don't seem to add up as they should, I have to take into account that there's a phase relationship here. When I include that, I actually find that they do add up to give me the total voltage drop around the circuit equals the applied voltage.